luulen, että se kir- kirkon vahvasti teollisuus se kestää Niin pois lähtee yhdeltä toista kymmentä vailla yksi. Olla joku muu maan. Ai jaha, niin, että ollaan niinku liian lähellä. 
Paikka, siellä olisi ollut oikeastaan okay, joku varha. Hieno, upean näköinen. Okei, ladies, gentlemen. One lady. The other persons are done. Welcome to our book town. Welcome to our bunker town. I first ask your pardon for my bad English. Because I'm an old East German. German Democratic Republic. We have learned English at school, but we had no chance to exercise it. But I hope you understand my English, okay? Your English okay. Yes, very, very good. It's too early, my friend, to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, by the way, we have here a book and bunker town, but you are here because we have bunkers. The military history is interesting for you. But by the way, two weeks ago, we had here the seventh International Book Town Festival. And we also had guests from Finland, from Sysme. Maybe you know that it's in the neighborhood of Lahti, a small town and also a book town in Finland. Mm -hmm. Timo and Raya were here. Very interesting. Okay. Sysma is a very famous place for making Finnish beer, Finnish traditional beer, which is called Sahti. Yeah, I, I visited uh, Sysma already. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> military past of Zossen Wünsdorf, I think unique in Germany. Because there is no other place where the German Kaiser, later Hitler, and then the Russians have left their military marks. The military history of Zossen Wünsdorf started already in 1910 with the German Kaiser. He had here a military training camp called Stammlager Zossen. And an infantry weapons school, a military sports gymnasium, and a military hospital. That were the preparations under Wilhelm II for the First World War here. Military significance in the Third Reich under Hitler. First reason. Since 1935, we had here, five kilometers in the south from here, the Fifth Armed Regiment of the German, a tank regiment. And in, in three large barrack areas, and in this tank regiment, the Germans made very much for the technical development of the German tanks for World War II. And the second reason for the military significance in the Third Reich was the stationing of the Supreme Command of the German Army on August 1939 in the bunker complexes Maybach 1 and 2 and Zeppelin. We will see a little bit later. On the 21st of April 1945, the Russians came to Wünsdorf. They took control about the whole area without any fight. And then, maybe you know that, was Wünsdorf from 1953 up to 1994, the headquarter of the Russian, of the Soviet forces in Germany. And the Russians surrounded this military town with a concrete wall, 17 kilometers long. All the streets were blocked, everywhere checkpoints of the Russians, and the whole area became more or less a forbidden area. 35 up to 40,000 Russians lived here. You can say Little Moscow in Germany. On the end of August in 1994, after German unification, the last Russian soldier left Wünsdorf. And that was also the end of the military past, of the military history here. Okay, we start now to our guided tour. It takes about 100 minutes, 45 minutes overground, and 50 minutes underground. Uh, I tell you a little bit, but Ask me, if you have questions, ask me, I try to answer. Okay? You understand my English? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you see that was a Russian checkpoint. The Russians had here in this area since 1953 the headquarter of the 16th Air Army. And that's why it's such a checkpoint of the Russians here in the landscape. Okay, history, Second World War. Maybach I and Zeppelin, built from 1937 up to 1939 for the supreme command of the German army here. Maybach I, 12 houses, bunker houses, where the general staff officers of the German army made their work. And what the general staff officers worked out here was communicated here. Zeppelin, communication bunker Zeppelin, also known as Exchange 500. And from Zeppelin we had during World War II 
telephone and teleprinter lines to all the battles of the Second World War, to Hitler's numerous headquarters, which he had built all over Europe, to the supreme command of the German Wehrmacht. You see, Maybach 1, two kilometers in the south from here, the bunker complex Maybach 2, built for rear services of the German army. The German names, the German uh, co uh, names, Maybach, may be a cover word, but the name Maybach was very important here in this time in neighborhood because the German tanks, which were developed here in the 5th Armed Regiment, were driven in this time by Maybach engines. And so the name was in the neighborhood. The name Zeppelin, maybe you have heard it already, Count Zeppelin, fame of hot air balloons. And so this name is standing for German engineering. And in its time, this bunker was a high-tech bunker, you can say. Okay. Um, the Americans bombed the German bunker complex on the 15th of March in 1945, but without demolishing any German bunker house. But the Russians had to blow up the German bunker complexes in 1946-1947 following the Potsdam Pact. And the Russian did it. And here you have a photo, and here you see the German Maybach houses in its original state. The first winter of the war, 1939-1940. And if you look back, you see the result of the Russian attempts to destroy the German bunker houses. And what you see there was a building A12. This building here. And now it's clearly we are standing here. The Russians, after World War II, had to blow up at first the German bunker houses, but when we had to stay longer in Germany when we wanted. Therefore, the Russians need new buildings. This building, the Russians, put since 1953 in the Maybach 1 complex, headquarter of the 16th Air Army of the Russians, and later the Russians built bunker. I tell you a little bit more about the Russian bunker if we have a look on Pansir, one of the Russian <coughs> bunkers from outside. Okay, once more, we are standing here. Now we go on this way through the Maybach 1 complex. When I tell you some sentence about the Russian bunkers, when we go into the free floor part of the German communication bunker, when you can make a short step into the north tunnel of the German bunker, and when we pass the long wing part and the west tunnel, and when we are outside. Okay? Gotcha. Questions? No. Then let's start. Please come to me. We have passed the building A1, and we are standing in front of the building A2. And you see, the building A2 looks like a, like a house. That's why I can tell you a little bit more about the German using in World War II. We had here four floors, four levels where the military worked here. Two overground, you see it in this direction. When a concrete layer, one meter thick, and two floors, two levels underground. The deepest point of the buildings, nine meters below ground. And in nine meters, each building had an access to a ring tunnel, which linked the 12 houses, 600 meter long, nine meters underground. And the, floor, uh, the four floors as a military work there, fulfilled with general staff offices, telephone and teleprinter technique. The two floors over, uh, uh, underground were completely hermetically protected against chemical and biological weapons, because these weapons were already new since World War I. Mm -hmm. And that's why hermetical protection for World War II. <coughs> Overground, we had between the concrete elements only brickwork and 24 windows. That knew it means during a bombing raid, the German officers and generals left the uh, floors overground and went <coughs> under the concrete layer and um, were sure completely hermetically protected in the two floors underground. 
The Germans built this the whole complex from spring 1937 up to August 1939. And one week before the war broke out, on the 25th, 22nd of August 1939, the whole complex came into work. You can say perfect timing by the Germans. In the building A1, we had in August 1939 a general staff department of the German Air Force. Because Air Force and Army during the battles very much links and that's why the neighborhood to get on a short way exact decisions. Building A2, general staff officers dealing with foreign armies west. That means armies from western European countries which were side by side with Hitler after German occupation. Armies from the Netherlands, from Belgium, from France, foreign armies west. Okay? Hmm? Next step? Yes. Yes. But, by the way, uh, somebody wanted to read the Russian uh, uh, names there. There is written down Altai Voroshilovgrad Viznya Divanosto. Altai, maybe you know, mountains in Asia, you can't translate. Voroshilovgrad is a town, but it's sit it is situated in the Ukraine, and the new name is again Lugansk. And Viznya Divyanosto means only spring 1990. All the Russian soldiers wrote down their date when they con uh, could back go uh, uh, to Russia on the walls here. And he could go back uh, on, uh, uh, sp in spring 1990, yes. And by the way, the normal Russian soldier had to work for three years here in the GDR. No chance to go back in this time to Russia to see the parents or to, uh, to see the girlfriend. Very hard time for this young Russian boys. Okay, next step. This is a building A3. Four Ain armies east. And one of the officers who walk, walked, worked here was General Gehlen. Maybe you have, you have heard the name uh, already. Galen founded after World War II, together with the Americans in Western Germany, the Galen Organization, later the Secret Service in West Germany, the Bundesnachrichtendienst. And the plans for the invasion of Russia of the Soviet Union in World War II, Barbarossa, were worked out in detail in this building here, for an army east. And one of the officers who take part here was General Paulus, later Field Marshal. Mm -hmm. And when Paulus went down in the history books in connection with the Battle of Stalingrad, Sixth Army capitulation. Yes. And maybe you will know that Paulus died 1957 in the GDR, in the German Democratic Republic in Dresden, because the East Germans wanted to make this all general useful for the development of the socialist army here in the GDR, but not very successful. The GDR army was founded in 1956. Paulus died already in 1957. Okay, next step. Yes. Black hole, you see there, was the entrance to the first floor underground, and under that, the second floor underground. The Russians blow up also the parts underground very strongly, but we make it special by the tour. And if you want, to, uh, if you want that, you can go uh, during such a special tour in the building A1, when you can use the old German ring tunnel nine meters below ground, and then you get out in one of these old destroyed German buildings. Special guided tours that takes a whole day if you want to go here underground. Here. We had the general quartermaster of the German army, General Wagner. And General Wagner was involved on in the attempts on Hitler's life by Stauffenberg and others. Maybe you remember 20th of July 1944, Wolfs Lear. Wa Stauf Stauffenberg, by the way, was stationed here up to, he had to go to Northern Africa, uh, also here in Sossen in, by, at the general staff offices. Wagner finished his life in this bunker house after the attempt on Hitler's life has failed, two days later. Yes. And Stauffenberg Wagner, not the only German officers here at the Supreme Command of the German Army fighting against Hitler. In the building A8, we had General Steve, 
also a man of the 20th of July. In the buildings 11 and 12, we had Felgiebel, communication system of the German army, also a man of the 20th of July. Of July. Oh, I tell you a little bit more about it. Walter van Brauchitsch, Haider. Very many generals fighting against Hitler here as the supreme command of the German army. But you remember, not very successful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Next step? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here we had Walter von Brauchitsch, commander and head of the German army in World War II up to 1941, when he had to go following a disagreement with Hitler about Barbarossa, the battle against the Russians. And Hitler himself made commander and head of the German army up to the end of the war. And you know the result. And since 1941, Hitler was the commander and head of the German army. But Hitler never visited this bunker complex here. That means Hitler never was here. Maybe you know, Hitler had during World War II nine headquarters all over Europe following the battles of the Second World War. And always in the neighborhood of Hitler's headquarters we had field quarters of the supreme command of the German army. So the generals of the army had to go from here into this uh, field quarters and the uh, generals of the German army who the Wehrmacht, Keitel Jodl or Hitler need to make the plans for World War II were always in their neighborhood. So that a visit of Hitler here ne was not necessary. Um, yes. And if Hitler was in Berlin, it was clearly who had to go to 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 mm. to to whom. Yeah, the general staff officers had to go to Berlin, and Hitler didn't come here outside. Hitler, spricht hier jemand Deutsch? Nee. Any people who speak German? It's it's difficult. It's difficult to say it in in English. Hitler, was diese Bunkeranlagen betrifft, sprach immer von Schwindelbunkern des Heeres, fake bunkers of the German army, because Hitler knew here were very many generals. Uh, of the 20th of July, fake bunker of the German army. Mm. There was a uh, kein Vertrauen. <coughs> difficult. In English is all difficult to say. Yeah, yeah. Oder er sprach vom versauten Geist der Generäle des Heeres in Sosna. Okay. Well, <laughs> a little bit later, I tell you to your, to your guide. Nemo, what? That's what I would get A6, the chief of the, uh, the chief of the general staff of the German army here. With the beginning of the war, Halder. Halder had to go already before the Battle of Stalingrad. Halder followed yeah. Zeitzler. Zeitzler had to go after the battle at the Kurska Bogen. Maybe you have heard it. Yeah. The big tank battle in World War II. The next chief of the general staff of the German army was Guderian, the German tank general. And the last one was General Hans Krebs. And Hans Krebs worked side by side with Hitler in Berlin, Neue Reichskanzlei, Führerbunker, up to the end of the war, and also finished his life with a pistol shot at the end of the war. Okay, Maybach one. Now let's pass an original Russian door, and then we are for some minutes by my Russian soldiers and friends. Yes. <laughs> Here we had the red star of the Russians. This star is absolutely stolen by people from Finland. Yes, really? Really? You have to go to the left and then to the right. Russian communication technique, Cold War. It's a little bit destroyed, but it worked in Russian time here. Russian Schützengräben. Schützengräben. Defair for defense of the bunker. Here in the wood, in the forest, you see a m little mountain. And under this mountain, we have the Russian bunker with the code name Panzer. This is a pre productive bunker by the Russians. Steel elements, pre productive. If, and if you uh, connect the steel ele elements, you get a very big tube. And this tube, the Russians, put to the half into the earth. The other half of the tube is overground. On the end was big doors. And ready was such an unimportant Russian bunker. 
uh, they covered it with earth, you see that, and then a little bit ventilation, where the back the black pipe you see it in the wood. This unimportant Russian bunker came into work in 1979 and was an education and exercise bunker for Russian communication soldiers and officers. And that's why a very unimportant uh, bunker. Yes, but 350 meters far from here, there in the forest, came into work in 1985, a very important Russian bunkers. Also, the English people say construction cut and cover, but concrete elements to the half into the earth, the other half overground. And this bunker was since 1985 the most important Russian bunker for air defense operations here in the German Democratic Republic. In this bunker, the Russians could control since 85 every flight about Germany, Western Europe and parts of Scandinavia. And if there was something wrong on air, in the air, the Russians could react in this bunker. The heart of the Russian air defense in Germany up to August 1994. The last Russian, uh, the last bunker, the Russians leave here in Germany before we went home on the end of August in 1994. <coughs> yes. But the Russian bunker complexes, you also can visit here, but this is another guided tour. Uh, it takes also about two hours already. Okay, or next. No, or hours. Uh, after it's been. Rainer von Schiffen is speaking Russian, yeah. Finnish, German, English, French. Perfectly. Yeah. Perfectly. <laughs> okay, we are standing now in front of the main entrance of the German communication bunker Zeppelin Exchange 500. If you look in this direction, you see, you see concrete elements. This was a German camouflage house situated on the main entrance of the German bunker. But this camouflage house was destroyed by American bombs on March 1945. That's why only the concrete rest. On the right side, you see also a concrete construction in the background, the second one. German bunker building. This was for concrete protection against bombing raid and there were the two emergency exits of the German bunker. And in front of us, you see the camouflage nets made by the Russians. Because Zeppelin was from August 1939 up to the 20th of April in 1945, the most important German communication bunker during World War II. On the, 20, on the 20th of April in 1945, the, Rus the Germans leave the bunker very quickly because the Russian tanks were already in standing in front of the bunker complex. The Russians took control about the whole communication bunker also without any fight. First step of the Russians, they brought out the German communication high-tech and brought it to the Soviet Union. After that, the Russians had to blow up also Zeppelin following the Potsdam Pact to destroy important fascist military buildings in Germany. The Russians did that. This resulted that the bunker filled full with groundwater from 1937 from the lowest level. And it was in the beginning of the 60s, you remember, Cuba crisis, Berlin Wall, that the Russians decided to use the old German bunker again. They brought out the groundwater and stationed in the old German bunker also a communication bunker. The most important communication bunker of the Russian headquarters of the Russian commander and head here in Sossen Wünsdorf. And the Russian communication bunker later had the name Ranjet. Ranjet is a word you can't translate, it's a star in the northern firmament. But my little Russians had not only to find a new name, we had to do something more important. The German bunker, built for World War II, was completely protected against bombing raid. But in the 60s, you need already bunker, which protect you also against nuclear, biological and chemical weapons. Mm. And that's why the Russian tried to make some parts of the old German bunker NBC safe. Mm. And if we go in now, the first part of the building is a Russian building. You will see very heavy blast doors, 2.5 tons, then an airlock system. On the left side, Wer ruft jetzt an, der Führer? 
<laughs> on the left side, shower rooms for decontamination. And if we have passed the Russian part of the building, we are standing under this concrete elements and where we are in the main entrance of the German bunker. Okay, questions? Now we have 10 degrees. Uh -huh. Becomes cold, my friend. Oh. I say it again, this is the Russian part of the building for NBC protection. Yes, so it's the last house you see that here. Okay. We have, we, we have passed now with the Russian part of the building <coughs> and now we are standing in the main entrance of the German communication by the And the German main entrance was nothing more than a short tunnel where the stairway were. And here in this part of the main entrance we had in German days a goods lift. That was the whole main entrance of Zeppelin in World War II. The military history of the, this bunker up to the end. The Russians used this bunker up to 1992. Then they brought all the things with military value out and took it back to Russia up to the end of August 1994. But when the Russian leaves this bunker in 1994, the whole bunker was a little museum about the Russian military using here in East Germany. Because the Russian electricity and the lights were working, was working completely. The ventilation system of the bunker was completely working. The groundwater management, very important for this bunker, <coughs> was working. And we had very much rules with military things in it. Also communication came of the Russians. But when I said that the Russians went home on the end of August in 1994, and in our wonderful land of Brandenburg, in the state of Brandenburg in Germany, nobody knew what we should do with this with the big Russian bunker. And without any idea for using, East German companies stripped this bunker completely. We brought all out what the Russian has left in the bunker and destroyed so the museum, you can say. Oh, yeah. Yes. Completely empty the bunker. Political, uh, uh, it was a political it's idea uh, after the Russians went home. Yes. Okay, but nevertheless, the concrete construction is very big. Let's go underground. It is below ground, underground. And we are in the first level, the first floor of the German bunker, Zeppelin. This was in German days the teleprinter level. The next level was the telephone level. And when you see there concrete, this is 20 meters underground. And there we have a third level. This third level is only two meters high. This was the level for the technical service of the German bunker. And Zeppelin, during World War II, was nothing more than a super modern post office, set deep below ground, fulfilled with telephone and teleprinter technique, and used by the army. And because it was used by the German army, we had here a, a 24 hours work a day, a free shift system, that means the German soldiers' officers went into the bunker, made their shift for eight hours, and if, if they had finished their shift, they leave the bunker. That means the free time, lunch, dinner, uh, sleeping, all overground. Underground only communication. And the whole bunker was nothing more than a super modern post office in World War II. Yes. Um, in the second and in the third floor, we make also special guided tours. But uh, over normal to 100 minutes, we go through the first floor. Please now go into the room where we have a little bit of a technique on the case. OK, maybe uh, you remember the German communication high tech made by Siemens and Halske, Lorenz, IG, Telefunken, Telefunken. The Russians brought out after World War II and brought it to the Soviet Union. 
The Russian communication technique, Germans in the second half of the 19th brought out and destroyed the bunker. And the result of uh, this, the bunker completely was empty. We try, try now to bring back step-by-step -step technique which was working here. On this side you see the German communication technique World War II, Reichspost technique. And on the other side a little bit Russian technique, we found it in the bunker after German companies stripped the bunker completely. By the way, Seppeli was built from 1937 up to 1939. Uh, in, uh, the Germans made here a big hole into the earth, put in the concrete construction, and after that they covered it with earth. So we had underground 40,700 square meters. That means about three football fields. And as a communication bunker, all the experts say, the biggest bunker which was built all over the world and worked so complete, completely. How, how do you build this? this the how we make the hole? Yeah. Yes, not with high tech from this year. Uh, the Germans had Schippen, okay. Schippen and uh, Kiplo, and that's all. The, what's heißt ein Bagger? Uh, the big, the big technique which you know from today, here was not. About 2,000 German uh, parapets were here for the bunker complex. And the most that we did here was handball. Handball, yes. Mm. Mm. Okay, here you see once more the whole German bunker complex in its state of 1944. Maybe you remember, here standing your bus, it was in German days the Hindu of Platz. When we passed the Maybach 1 complex on this way, in the neighborhood of Maybach 1 we had in World War II a barrack area for the free time of the general staff officers. This area destroyed by American bombs on the 15th of March in 1945. Then we had here a very big barrack area for young German ladies, the German name is Nachrichtenhelferin. Girls who made underground communication work. Nachrichtenhelferin Blitzmähler. Yes. Because from 1939 up to 1943, uh, almost men worked underground. But you remember 1943, the war situation. Everyone was needed at the front, at the battles. And since 1943, these young German ladies were here in the bunker. Also, this barrack area of the, of the Nachrichtenhelferin destroyed by American bombs on the 15th of March in 1945. Yes. And this is the free floor part of the German bunker. And this is the two floor part. And now I send you to the North Tunnel for a short step, and you see here three houses. And in the middle house, we had the entrance to the North Tunnel, German camouflage houses. And a little bit later, I will show you the photos of these German camouflage houses. And now, here in this area, we have the Russian bunker Panzer, maybe you remember. And here in this area, the Russian bunker UK-20 Nickel for air defense operations. Yes. Okay. Nee, 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 nicht den roten Stempel drücken, da ist Alarm im Kreml. My friend. The signal to Moscow, if you take this. <laughs> It's working. Okay, uh, once more the topic camouflage houses. I showed you the three houses and here we have, for example, the north entrance of the German bunker. And where we had these three nice houses. Photos from 1947. In this building we had the entrance to the German bunker and to the North Tunnel. And if you see this house, nobody is thinking that we have there an entrance to the bunker, a camouflage house. You had to pass this door here and 40 meters underground the North Tunnel. And the German bunker entrance house had under this normal roof ceiling such a concrete construction. 
That means this black hole was this door here in German days. Concrete construction clearly to protect the entrance of the bunker against bombing raid. That's why in German days this concrete construction. And then German military camouflage completely. In this building lived people, but only people who had were in direct link to the communication bunker. You see here on the photo Mrs. Scheer and her daughter. The husband of Mrs. Scheer takes the photo. And Mr. Scheer was a very important member of the German Reichspostministerium. And so in a direct link to the communication bunker Zeppelin exchange 500. Yes. Uh, by the way, some sentences, uh, sentences to the German camouflage. It is, maybe it is not a wrong idea to, set, to make their free buildings, to let people live in there, and to tell the spion from the Americans, from the Allies, here is nothing with war, here is nothing with bunker. These are free, very peaceful German houses. But you remember, this was the north entrance to the German communication bunker, Exchange 500. I told you about the free shift system in this bunker. Every eight hours, if, she, if the shift was changed, about 150 people leave this door and 150 people went into the bunker. And I think also the cra craziest alien, uh, uh, alias spy should know a little bit too much men all, all eight hours for Mrs. Scher. <laughs> <laughs> but that is German camouflage, not only the German camouflage. Okay, we leave now the free floor part of the German bunker. 20 meters below ground, the lowest level. This free floor part was in German, in Russian days, Ranjet, the NBC protection part of the bunker, the communication bunker of the Russian headquarters. And that's why we leave the free floor part again through an airlock system, the Russian airlock system. And then we are in the long wing part of the bunker. Okay. One of three locations in Zeppelin where the Russians tried to blow up the German bunker after World War II. Not very successful, and that's why the Russians finished their attempts to destroy the German bunker. In front of us, you see three meter concrete, the bunker ceiling from German days. But the big hole made by the Russians. But the three meter concrete is not the complete German ceiling construction. You remember, we are standing 40 meters below ground. That's why, over these three meters we had in German days, again two meters earth or sand, then again a concrete layer, one meter thick, and when once more, six up to nine meters earth, sand again. That means earth, concrete, earth, concrete, sandwich construction. And this construction made this bunker undestroyable for any bombs during World War II. We are, uh, have all experts the same opinion. We don't know exactly why the Russians blow up also the German bunker ceiling. Because you see, this hole is worked out very exactly. If you want to destroy the bunker, you can do it on another way. But we have an idea. Here was daylight. That means the bunker was opened up to the overground. Here we had after World War II the German communication technique. Very much, very many, very heavy. This technique the Russians wanted to bring into the Soviet Union after World War II. And we think we wanted to do that also on a direct way overground. And that's why this big hole uh, in the German bunker ceiling. Later, in the beginning of the 60s, you remember, the Russians want to use the bunker again. The Russians brought out brickwork over the, uh, the soul, and on the brickwork we have again concrete layer, and on the concrete layer you see there, we have again three and a half meters earth, and then the normal wood. Yes. And this pipe on the left side was a part of the Russian ventilation system installed by the Russians. Sometimes we have here underground in our bunker people who think very bad about the Russians. Why not? But if, we see, <laughs> but if we see that here, we very often say, oh, that's typical for the Russians. <laughs> they make such a big hole in the German bunker ceiling 
to bring out such a small pipe. <laughs> That's right, my friend. Bloody Russians. For the German building, you see that here, this surrounding the doorways, a typical feature of the German architecture in the 30s. Also schools and so on, or hospitals, built with this surrounding doorways, but also barracks and bunkers. Okay, here we have in German days different rooms, you see it's written down, and in, in Russian days, uh, the Russians here had workshops. We pass now the long way path and go downstairs. Follow me! Because the other group is already coming. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Please not, go not inside because the air condition there is very bad. You have about 10 seconds. <laughs> and now please be careful, we have Russian color on the walls. <laughs> yes, and this color is not so good for your clues. Look here. <laughs> you get a Russian souvenir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are now 18 meters below ground. Uh, second floor of the long wing part of the German bunker. And in this part of the German bunker we had the technical heart uh, of Exchange 500. And all the technique which was necessary that we could make here a telephone and teleprinter was stationed here. A little bit of the technique you see here on the photos. German high tech for World War II. Russian using in this area you can see zero. The only Russian uh, using you see there is this wall made from wood. It was the end of a pistol range in Russian times. That uh, means Russian soldiers and officials could make here their pistol exercises. Okay, next up. Okay, if you look from this wall there up to this wall where, you have the long wing part of the German bunker in one view. From this wall up to this wall, we have 117 meters. Yes. Uh, the heating in the bunker. Now we have here in the bunker, in summer and winter, exactly 10 degrees. Because earth and concrete make normal temperatures, constant temperatures, 10 degrees. The German bunker had no heating, but we had here about 20 degrees underground because we had here two things which made the, bunker, made the bunker warm. The first thing was the technique which worked here, and the second thing, thing was the body of the people who worked here underground. In one shift, we have not exact numbers, but in one shift we had about 500 people who worked here in the bunker. And these two things make the bunker warm about 20 degrees. And then the Germans had here a very intelligent uh, chimney system, you see here these holes under the ceilings, and these holes we had in each floor. And then you see there such an element called tampon or from steel, and this element goes in this channel there. This channel goes up and is over in the next floor also open. And that's why we had here a, a natural ventilation system, very clever made by the Germans already in the second half of the 30s. Yes. The technique you see here we found in the bunker. Russian high tech. Russian television. <laughs> it's still working. It's still working. Uh, South Africa Championship Soccer. I have seen here the uh, matches. Do you my guy this first? Yes? Really? It's in color TV. I'm very impressed with all the And, by the way, in this, I said it to you, in this part the Russians uh, used the German bunker not. That's why we have here also in the walls original constructions, electricity constructions from the German days. And up to these elements, we had the water in the bunker after the Russians blew up the bunker in 1946-1947. Okay, COVID? No. Let's go to the next step, West Tunnel. I switch on the line, just a moment. Thank <laughs> you.
Ha, ha, ha. Good video, yes or not? Okay. This is the west tunnel of the German backyard. This west tunnel is 260 meters long. We have here a north tunnel of the German bunker. This tunnel is 220 meters long. And this long tunnel the German built because in these tunnels worked water pumps. And these worked water pumps brought out the groundwater in front of Zeppelin. So that Zeppelin could not fill full with mm. groundwater. Groundwater level here 18 meters below ground. Uh, with the water, uh, the water the, the Germans brought into the bunker because we had here mushrooms and waters, closets and so on and so on. Okay, now you have 260 meters and 61 steps. And then we are back in the German summer. Okay, in this way please. You have to go. That's all. Also, one German camouflage house. The Russians did destroyed this camouflage house completely. And later, they put their own camouflage house on the west entrance of the German bunker. And the west tunnel we passed just goes in this direction. And 260 meters far from here, where in the wood is Zebelin, Exchange 500. This building here, you can't see so much because we have trees and forests. All Russian buildings. Here the group Ranyet was stationed, communication soldiers for the Russian communication bunker. In this area we were stationed. And you see here this big football field. Two times in a year, on April and on October, we make here meetings for old military cars and ah. tanks and so on. And on the 9th of October is again a the meeting. And the whole football field is full with old cars made in United States, Great Britain, France, Russian, and so on. Very interesting meeting. Thousands of visitors. And we also have the chance to go with the cars into our bunker park. Okay, the Russians say back to the book town. I say Davai Domoi. Thank you. Davai Domoi, we have a new idea. Yeah, not finished. Up to, uh, this is the right way. <laughs> Tämä on pari sataa metriä syvin kohta. Kestää sitten ihan suora. Mitä hittoa? 10 megatonnin latauksen vuoden päälle. On joo. Aika paljon pienempiä. 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 